Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to John, chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. So grace and peace to you this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Like I mentioned in the community updates, or when I was welcoming you here on the church calendar, right after Christmas comes Epiphany. Uh, And so what that means is last week we started this new sermon series. Uh, We thought it'd be good to spend five weeks total, the next five weeks, it was last week was the first, today's the second, we got three weeks after this, uh, but we're spending five weeks looking at different epiphanies that people have throughout the Bible. Uh, So if you were with us last week, one thing we were saying, saying is to have an epiphany is just to realize the truth about something. And so when we look at all the different epiphanies that people have throughout the New Testament, uh, what's happening is they are just realizing the truth about Jesus. And you see, whenever they do, it's always having this major impact on their life. And so the name we have given this series is Saving Realizations. And what that's meant to convey is a lot of the time when we realize something, it doesn't have any real impact. It's just kind of an intellectual thing. And yet when people realize the truth about Jesus, it is much more than that. In particular, it's the kind of realization that actually saves you. And the biblical word for save is this Greek word sozo, right? And that word sozo actually means healing. And so a saving realization is you realize the truth about Jesus in a way that actually heals you. It begins to renovate your thoughts. You could say it starts reorienting your affections. It even begins to rewrite your entire way of life. And so the question is, how does that happen? That's what we're looking at each week. Uh, So today, it's the Epiphany of Nathaniel. We just read the passage about it. As we go to that passage, we're going to go through each part of it. And there are really just two things that happen that lead to this saving realization. So we're going to start with the first thing, just to introduce it. Uh, My freshman year of college, I had applied and gotten into USC. The thing is, that was always kind of my dream school. Uh, You see, my grandpa had gone there. My mom went there. Both my older sisters went there. Maybe the most important thing of all is I have always been obsessed with USC football. Uh, So I was totally excited about going there. And so I moved down. I'm living in the suite with seven other guys. What it was, it was four different rooms with two of us in each room with like a little common area in the middle. And the thing is, from really early on, I hit it off with the guys who were there. Uh, They were from all over the country. It was just a really diverse, sneak group of guys. And remember, that was the year that the first Xbox came out. Uh, So together as a suite, we sat in that common area and probably played 40 hours a week of Madden. Uh, And so my first month or two there, I was just incredibly excited about my future. In my mind, you see, this was going to be my launching pad into adult life. Never mind whole Xbox habit. Uh, We were launching into adulthood, and so like I said, on the one hand, I was incredibly excited. But on the other hand, I was incredibly lonely. The thing is, I didn't know why. It didn't make sense to me, if only because I was surrounded by tons of people, and yet I would go to bed at night. 
And I felt really alone. So what I did is I started going to everything social that I could, which is not really me. I'm kind of an intro- introvert. Uh, but I started playing on the USC club volleyball team. I started going to Campus Crusade for Christ. I went to pretty much every sporting event imaginable. I even went out and rushed a fraternity. And so I was doing all these things in order to feel less lonely, right? And yet, for whatever reason, it did not work. And so what happened is, over time, I kind of gave up. I got really reclusive. I kind of withdrew into my own head. I stopped doing anything social, so I would just study all week, and then I would rush home every weekend. And so by the end of that first year, I was lonelier than I had ever been in my life. And what started out as my dream school that I was super excited about turned out to be a school that I would spend just one very disorienting year at. After which, I moved back home so I could go to COC. So how come I felt so lonely? Even when I was surrounded by people. It wasn't until much later, probably like 10 or so years later, uh, that I started realizing the root of loneliness is not whether you just do or don't have people around you. It's whether the people who are around you actually know you which that just takes time, right? And yet that does not change the fact that any time you feel like no one knows you, it can start to feel like you do not even know who you are yourself. You see, because our identity is always rooted in relationship, and so if no one really knows you, it can start to feel like you don't really have an identity. So just to put this out there, is there a way to have an identity that is never in question? Meaning no matter the circumstance, deep down you know exactly who you are. In today's passage, Nathaniel is coming to Christ, and what Christ says to him is, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And it's kind of a cryptic saying to us, right? But you see, what it's actually referencing is the story of Jacob. I don't know if you know it, but I want to dig into it a little bit, and I think this will help us make sense of what Christ is saying to Nathaniel. Uh, so if you go all the way back to Genesis, one thing about Jacob is he had a twin brother named Esau. And between the two of them, Esau was actually the firstborn. And so what that meant is everything that belonged to their father was going to go to Esau. Uh, That was just the way their culture worked. Being the firstborn was always the identity that mattered. And so in a lot of ways, if you were not the firstborn, you were kind of overlooked. You didn't seem to matter as much. You didn't get as much attention. You didn't even get a lot of airtime in the Bible. It's almost like the firstborn never gets talked, or the, if you're not the firstborn, you never get talked about. And so if you're not the firstborn, it was almost like no one even really noticed you. And perhaps every middle child right now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I can't get into it, but Jacob has this long history of thinking that he has to be the firstborn. Uh, He's not, but he really wants to be. And so what happens is when their father is dying, and their father is Isaac, and at this point Isaac's totally blind, he knows he's going to die, so he's going to give everything to Esau. He's going to bless Esau, pass on his patrimony. You know, what Jacob does is right before his father dies, he goes into the room where he's dying, and he pretends to be Esau. You see, Esau was known for having a lot of body hair. Jacob was pretty much the exact opposite. And so what Jacob does is he just puts on himself a coat of fur, goat skins. And what he is essentially doing is he is just hiding who he really is. In other words, he is covering up his real identity under some sort of false identity that he knows his father will bless. And the thing is, in one sense, it totally works. He tricks his father into giving him that blessing, and yet in another sense, it is a total disaster. For Jacob, that is. You see, because it is all a lie. He is pretending to be someone he is not. And so no one really knows who Jacob is. And you see, the problem with that is if, it, if our identity is always rooted in relationship, relationship, 
then what is Jacob's identity? At this point in his life, he does not really have one. Or maybe more accurately, what he has is a false one. And so what's so telling about this is throughout the Bible, what always indicates your identity is in fact your name. Your name always tells people who you are. And you see the name Jacob literally means deceiver. Meaning no one really knows the real you. And so that is Jacob. And yet here's what happens. A little later on, he has an encounter with God. And it's kind of a weird passage. A lot of weird passage in the Old Testament. Uh, but he and the Lord actually get on the ground and they wrestle. And what Jacob keeps saying to him is, I have to have your blessing. I will not let go until you bless me. And what is so fascinating about him saying that is he always thought the identity that mattered was being blessed by his father. But all of a sudden, what he is essentially saying is the identity that matters is being blessed by the father. By God, that is. And so the first thing God does, he says, okay, tell me your name. In other words, what is your identity? And he says, it's Jacob. And you see, by saying that, what he is actually saying is kind of a deceiver. It's my name. In other words, you want to know my identity, but at this point, I don't even really have one anymore. Now, I used to be this. I tried to be that right now. I don't even know who I am. And you see, the great irony of him saying that is on the one hand, he is admitting that it has all been a lie, but on the other hand, for once in his life, he is being totally honest. It seems as if he is ready to shed that old identity, doesn't it? And so the second thing God does is he goes, you're not going to be called that anymore. You are no longer Jacob. You are now Israel is the name God gives him. Remember, in the Bible, your name is your identity. And so what God is doing is he is actually giving him a new identity. The thing is, the word Israel, what it means is someone who wrestles with God. Or you could even say someone who has a relationship with God. And so you see, all of a sudden, Jacob's identity is totally different. He always used to be hiding who he was. Now he is totally honest. He always used to feel like he was alone in life. Now he's in relationship with the living God. It always used to be that no one really knew who Jacob was. Now he has a God who knows everything about him. And so again, his whole identity has changed all because he has had this encounter with the Lord. And what the Lord did was he spoke a new truth into his life. Namely, you are not going to be Jacob anymore, meaning you're not going to be a deceiver anymore. Instead, you are going to be an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. So in today's passage, what does Christ say to Nathanael? Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And you see, what he is saying to Nathanael is the exact same thing that God said to Jacob. And that is because it is the exact same God who is saying it. It's the God who is never deceived by us. It's the God with whom we often wrestle, sometimes without even knowing it's him that we're wrestling with. It's the God who wants to bless you. It's the God who fully knows you. It's the God who can change your story. It's the God who has the power to give you a new identity. That's who this Jesus is. And so that's why he's saying, behold an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And yet in the passage, I kind of want that to be like, the turning point for Nathaniel, but it's not. He was like, wait. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This Jesus cannot be God is his whole thought process. God is invisible. God is spirit. God is up in heaven. God is all these things that Jesus is not. And so he hedges and he asks Jesus, how do you know me? 
And that's the thing. In the presence of Jesus, you are fully known. But how is that? That's what Nathaniel wants to know. And what Jesus says to him is, before you ever came to me, you were standing under the fig tree, and I saw you. Now think about that. That's not just a statement of superior vision. <laughs> like, Jesus saw that guy coming from 100 yards off. Wow. No. You see, to be standing under the fig tree is a typical metaphor in the Bible. In particular, a fig tree always represents God's people. And so when Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree before you came to me, what he is saying is, I saw you standing among the people of God. And before you ever took a single step toward me, I had always seen you. I've seen everything you've gone through. I've seen everything you've done. I've watched your whole life unfold to this point. And the thing is, I have always seen the real you. Beneath all the outer images that you project and that everyone else sees, I have always seen you. Is what Jesus is saying. To which Nathaniel responds, Rabbi, you must be the Son of God. He's saying, you're God. You see, that's the first part of his epiphany. He is realizing that this Jesus fully knows him, and so this Jesus must be fully the Lord. Now, let's go to the second part. This will be a little bit briefer, I promise. Uh, at this point, Nathaniel's totally amazed, right? Now, the thing is, he's probably heard the story of Jacob multiple times. He's heard about, the God, heard about God in the Bible over and over again. He's heard about how this God throughout the Bible will come into people's lives and do these crazily redemptive things. And yet he probably never expected to meet this God in real life, which most people who read the Bible don't. And so to Nathaniel, this is a huge deal. And yet to Jesus, for whatever reason, it's not. It's actually kind of a funny exchange. Nathaniel's over here losing his mind, and what Jesus said to him is, you believe in me because I know you? Buddy, you're going to see a lot greater things than these. And so then what Jesus says, this is the last verse in our reading, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're going to see heaven opened, and you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so apparently, whatever that means, that's going to be even better than Jesus fully knowing you. Now, so we're going to look at what that means in a minute, but first I just want to put this out there. Uh, when it comes to posting things on social media, it's going to sound random, but uh, when it comes to posting things on social media, just kind of a survey for us. Let's say you post a picture of yourself. Uh, you kind of like the way you look in it, right? Uh, you put it up there. Are you going to be happier if you get 337 likes or you get three likes? Don't have to pretend, I'm just going to guess 337 is going to make you happier. Uh, so another question, let's say you post a picture of your home. It's a photo of your Christmas decorations. You decide you're going to share it with other people. And so the question is, are you going to be happier if you get a bunch of comment, positive comments? Like, wow, beautiful home. That looks so nice. You're just amazing. Or would you be happier if you got, I don't know, other kinds of comments? Ugh, that's a little gaudy. How much money did you spend on that? Do you really still have your decorations up? It's epiphany, not Christmas. So which kind of comments would make you happier, positive or weird? Positive, right? Uh, and so another question. When you go to post something, do you think maybe, just maybe, even if subconsciously, perhaps you are choose, you're going to choose something that you think other people are going to like? Uh, do you think that affects your decision at all? And I would say, yeah, for sure. Uh, so here's what I'm trying to get at. Now, one thing we've seen with the advent of social media, and this has always been the case, so it happens in real life too all the time, it's just that social media makes it really obvious. Uh, it's the reason we project certain images in life is mostly because we just want people to like us. 
which sometimes, whatever, not that big of a deal. It's totally normal to want to be liked, and yet if you just think back for a second to Jacob. Remember when he was pretending to be Esau, what he was doing is he was projecting a very particular image. And the thing about it is, A, it was not true. B, because it wasn't true, he started to lose his real identity, and yet C, the reason he projected that image anyway is he just wanted to be loved. Right? He just wanted his father's blessing. And so whereas the desire to be liked or loved is totally natural, it can also lead us to lose our real identity. And you see, the only thing that can totally prevent us from doing that is knowing for sure already we are totally and absolutely loved. So if we go back to the passage, Jesus has this saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're going to see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And you see, what that is a reference to, again, is something that happened to Jacob. It's in Genesis 28 in particular. Jacob's out on this journey. He's supposed to be going to Haran. It starts getting kind of dark, and so he decides to put his head down and go to sleep. And you see, what happens as he's sleeping is God gives Jacob a dream. And in the dream, the heavens actually open up. And there's a ladder that reaches up to heaven, and it has angels ascending and descending on it. And so what Jacob says in response is, this is the gate of heaven. In other words, this is where I see what God is really like. That's what the gate of heaven means. You can see who God is. And so somehow in this place, Jacob can see the face of God. And yet it never says how. Nor does it ever say what he looks like. It just says there's a ladder that opens up the gate of heaven. But you see, here's the thing. In today's passage, when Christ tells Nathaniel, you're going to see greater things than these, and then he starts talking about that same ladder that opens up the heavens so that we can see what God is really like, you have to ask, what is he talking about? What's the ladder that on the one hand is planted in the earth, but on the other hand opens up heaven? I don't know. Seems kind of bizarre. Uh, ladders are made of wood, so what piece of wood could open up the gate of heaven and show us what God is really like? It's the cross. It's the cross. That is the ladder that opens heaven. I mean, that is where heaven and earth finally come together. That is where we see what God is really like. And so whereas at first Nathaniel realized, his first realization was that Jesus fully knew him, knew him, which is great. It wasn't until the cross that he realized that Jesus fully loved him, which is even greater. So the second we realize that, we don't need to pretend. We don't need to project false images. We don't need to lose our identity in order to be liked. We can be totally certain of who we are. If only because our identity is always rooted in relationships and in this particular relationship there is nothing to doubt. He fully knows you. And he fully loves you. And so at the beginning I asked, is there a way to have an identity that is never in question? That no matter the circumstance, deep down you know exactly who you are. And this is our answer. It's just that it's not an identity we somehow choose or create or even earn for that matter. It is an identity that God gives to us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That was Nathaniel's epiphany. I pray that it is ours as well. So let's pray as our worship team comes forth. Father, we 
thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, uh, this one who has always known us. Even when we have not known him or been anywhere close to him, uh, he has always seen us, always been incredibly near, even when we're far. We just thank you for that gift. At the same time, Lord God, we pray that you would open our eyes, that that is our real identity in this life. Uh, as important as all these other things are that shape who we are, and even as important as things like our family and our friends are for giving us a sense of self, and determining our identity, we still pray that you would help us to seek our deepest identity and to find our truest selves in losing ourselves to the love of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen.